morning, everyone. I've spent uh, around 25 years helping to look after the archaeology of Greater Manchester, and uh, I provide archaeological planning advice to 10 unitary authorities of Greater Manchester. So I just wanted to share some of my experiences with you this morning um, about uh, how we've tried to engage with the community and development. Um, we're lucky in Greater Manchester because uh, about five, four or five years ago we, uh, we set up a Greater Manchester Archaeology Federation. We've always had a rich history of community engagement in the county, uh, going back to the community programme days of the 1980s. Um, and we've got 16 local archaeology groups, all local societies in the county and slightly beyond the borders as well. Um, coming together on a quarterly basis at Manchester Museum, we host some meetings, um, but uh, Salford University and GMAS, my organisation, facilitate the group. And you can see the group shares experiences, um, they share skills, uh, um, uh, insurance information, equipment, speaker listings like that, and help us run an, uh, an annual archaeology day. Um, one thing Gandhi Myers, my colleague, and I tried to do as uh, planning archaeologists was encourage these groups to um, comment on their local planning applications to give us some support and strengthen our work. That, that hasn't really worked for some reason, and it's maybe something we can come back to in the discussion, sort of trying to embed the community in that early stage of planning work. Um, <coughs> but you can see it's also, also we have representatives from CBA and uh, YAC there as well. Um, this is the distribution of the, the groups and uh, it is a thriving community and we're hoping to set up a new one in Salford um, fairly shortly. Um, the important thing for us is in fostering these groups and uh, encouraging them and helping them, uh, perhaps with some of the skills as well, is that they do a really important job for us because as um, development control archaeologists obviously the work we do for that is very skewed to where development pressure is often in urban areas but these groups go out up into the Pennine uplands into parks into greenfield sites where you wouldn't normally expect any development archaeology and their research and investigation sort of help uh, balance that skew in our understanding of the archaeological res resource and research framework. So they do a really valuable job. And we've also had a lot of success with uh, larger scale community archaeology projects such as uh, the current Dig Greater, Manchester, Dig, Dig Greater Manchester project which has involved thousands and thousands of school children and uh, hundreds of adult volunteers. And that's skilling up a large community across Greater Manchester, uh, who hopefully will take a keen interest in their heritage and local developments in the future. Um, just touching on a few types of uh, uh, community engagement through the uh, uh, planning system. Um, one of the best ways to embed community engagement in uh, development projects is to get in early and of course MPPF focuses on pre-application, early discussion um, uh, of the archaeological interests and, and needs for the heritage and that's a good time to start embedding the idea of having some community engagement and particularly for the larger scale urban regeneration projects like the one we have at Central Salford um, working with the um, uh, Greater Manchester Archaeology Federation members um, and members of the local community in Islington and Salford in this instance, we've been able to get them involved in helping out with the archaeological excavations. Um, and it's helped as well, I have to say, because we're looking at uh, uh, former workers' housing, it's a sort of environment they can relate to, some of their ancestors lived in some of these properties as well. Um, but the other important point is that it can be great PR for the developer as well. It can help sell their development, show that they're fairing and uh, are uh, within the planning statements, of course, they have to demonstrate community engagement. So archaeology can be a really good tool for that. And we've had a recent case at the late 18th century New Bailey Prison in Salford where we're able not only to do guided tours, but uh, to have uh, a couple of weeks of 
community archaeology on the site. And um, the developer in cities funds was really engaged with that process. And we've seen a good example of Hungary as well, of course. Um, again, pre-application, some developers, large developers, acquire sites and they know what they want to do on those sites, but again, they want to engage with local community way <coughs> before putting a planning application in. This is Worsley New Hall, where Peel Holdings wants to build a new hotel on the site of the uh, uh, former hall. So several years before even contemplating putting an application in, they wanted to win the local community to, to this idea and do the right thing by archaeology. So um, working with them, um, uh, University of Salford archaeologists were able to develop a, a large-scale community project, working with local schools and residents. And uh, some of the skills and knowledge that some of the, that these people have can be crucial to a project success. The chap on the left there, um, just through serendipity, he used to be a lift engineer. And uh, we found an intact lift from the early 20th century in the basement of, of Worsley New Hall. And he was able to tell the archaeologists how it worked, where it was made. Uh, and those are just the sort of things that we can bring to these projects. And Pete's already mentioned the challenges of health and safety, but don't be put off by that. It can be hard work, but you can achieve some amazing things. And accepting that many sites aren't appropriate for uh, direct community participation, but here we have um, uh, a massive excavation on the site of Ashbury Zion Foundry in Gorton, East Manchester, uh, a new centre for network rail now. Um, and they really bought into the idea of trying to bring in one of the local groups to help with the professional archaeologists on site, SLR. And SLR themselves accepted they didn't have the complete skill set and knowledge to understand some of this complex industrial archaeology on site. So one of our groups, the Manchester Region Industrial Archaeology Society, um, were able to come onto the site and help them interpret some of these uh, historical um, uh, foundry elements to the complex and that's a real two-way benefit there where they're bringing their their knowledge and expertise but also work alongside the professional archaeologists who have control of health and safety and the recording techniques and this is ended up in one of our popular book series publications on still an open shore which uh, won uh, a national award for uh, popular publication on industrial archaeology. Um, and the other way we can do it, of course, is um, <coughs> uh, where we have opportunities through the planning system. Andy and myself will put on a condition on the planning application requesting the opportunity taken to uh, either directly or indirectly engage the local communities. An example were Hume, in Hume, Burley Fields. Uh, for the new MNU campus, Manchester Met Metropolitan University campus, where some local schools and adults were able to take part in the dig and we had media coverage and local press as well. And if it's not possible to directly involve the community, there's all sorts of ways of disseminating the results. And it's very important that we as archaeologists don't go and dig a site leave it and nobody in that area knows what was found or why we were there. Um, so there's plenty of ways of doing that. I'm sure most of you have done these open days. Um, this is an example at the new co-op HQ site in Manchester where we had a thousand people down one Saturday to look at former uh, workers housing. Bottom right is the Graphene Institute at Manchester University. Again another successful open day with university employees came down to look at the former workers housing and of course um, the legacy of the site can be to put up information boards so although all the archaeology of site is gone the new people coming in get a sense of history in place about where, where they're living and one of the things we found works well is to try and uh, develop popular publications for the larger scale commercial projects. We've now got up to 13 in our Greater Manchester Past Revealed series and uh, we produce about a thousand print run for these and give them freely to local communities, to schools, to libraries, to museums. When they're all run out uh, we put PDFs on the website. Um, so that's gone down really well and it's a really attractive 
and useful way of telling the local people about what was found. <coughs> so the good thing is today um, MPPF has some nice hooks uh, on which to justify community engagement in the planning process. Uh, when Andy and I write our conditions of consent for applications, where we think it's appropriate, we, we can use those conditions to make sure that uh, the community are involved. And justification, of course, for that is paragraph 141 from MPPF. But more recently, we've also got best practice guidance now, which um, embeds that and enforces um, uh, um, that, uh, that paragraph from MPPF, which is uh, section 43 under public engagement. And that's a really useful summary of the way in which community archaeology can be done on commercial sites. Um, I'm just getting near to the end, but I just wanted to reflect on um, how difficult it's been for local government archaeologists in recent years. This is a survey we did in 2010, um, looking at the how our GAIR members um, <coughs> connected to education and outreach. And um, as you can see, the majority of them felt it was a crucial part of what they did in their normal work. And there's a whole range of activities they undertook. Um, sorry, that's on its side, so you have to skew your head. But uh, <coughs> um, to try and uh, disseminate the wonderful archaeology that they were dealing with in, in their area. Um, much of it in their own time. But sadly, even five years ago, it was recognised that it was a major threat to the services uh, coming up, as you can see, by their understanding of what's going to happen in the future. And of course, those threats have come, come to fruition. And we're looking now at another, in places, 40% cut of, of local authority budgets. So it's not going to get any better. And I think what's happening now is you're getting a very mixed bag across the country where you get some well-resourced local government services. In other areas, perhaps in the north and midlands, there's almost nothing there. And archaeologists, local government archaeologists, are having to concentrate on their statutory, uh, minimum statutory duties. And sadly, the community work that many, there were many dedicated posts in 2010 even, for community archaeology in local governments, but those have all gone because those weren't seen as essential to the service. And we are under-resourced and under pressure, and I think um, we're going to have to look at new models of working in some parts of the country. I'm going to leave that with you. I'm not going to run through that because I hope you can all see that. Those are just some of the um, my observations. Um, from thinking about this talk today, which hopefully might stimulate a little bit of uh, discussion uh, that we're going to have shortly. Thank you, Kevin.